I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this fascinating symposium. And I will be talking about microbial ecology is fundamental for physical and emotional health and behavior. I'd like to start out with a simple schematic of um, the brain gut microbiome ecosystem with basically the two main nodes or hubs, the brain connectome, all the networks within the brain um, and the gut connectome with the microbiome in it, gut connectome being the combination, the interaction of immune cells, nervous cells, um, endocrine cells, and the microbiome. You can see what uh, characteristic for a complex system, there's bidirectional communication um, loops between the different nodes in this, um, in this network, including the exposome or the environment, which um, is an integrate um, interaction and communication with the brain and the gut microbiome. Let me start out with a few key features of the of a healthy ecosystem. So the 101 of, of ecosystem um, biology. So ecosystems are characterized by keystone species, richness, diversity, responsiveness to changing environments, resilience, colonization resistance, um, and resistance against invaders. All these are shared properties of healthy ecosystems, regardless if they're at the microbial level or at the macrobiological uh, level. And I'll give you a few examples. Um, so keystone species, um, most people have heard about the keystone species in different uh, environments, like the grizzly bear, the elephants, the wolf, um, all in their own unique context. They're not, so the, the nomination, the, the classification as a keystone species does not carry from one environment to another. Um, particularly illustrative is the, the sea otter in the kelp forests of um, Northern California and, and the West Coast. Um, so in the presence of the keystone species, the sea otter, um, there's a healthy kelp forest uh, a key feature of, of a healthy um, um, system and a small number of sea urchins which um, essentially feed on these on, on the kelp. When the sea otter is absent as like near extinction um, 100 years ago, then there's an overgrowth of the sea urchins um, and a destruction of the um, of, of, of the kelp forests by these um, by these animals. Um, and the whole ecosystem collapses. Shown here, you don't need to look at the details, but you see a large number of players um, um, with, the with the keystone species, the sea otter, lots of connections, interconnections. Um, and after the sea otter is gone, you see a collapse of this ecosystem with an overgrowth of, a, uh, of the sea urchins and um, a decrease of both connections and abundance of, of players. So the keystone species concept um, has been applied to the gut microbiome. Um, as written here, a quote from Banerjee, microbial keystone taxa are highly connected taxa that individually or in a guild exert a considerable influence on microbiome structure and functioning irrespective of their abundance. So even small amounts of keystone species have an important influence. These taxa have a unique and crucial role in microbial communities and their removal can cause a dramatic shift in microbiome structure and functioning. So there's two ways that um, a healthy microbiome functioning uh, can result from. One is a abundance of certain taxa that have an impact um, through their abundance on all the other players in this system. And there is another mode of interaction keystone taxa, which can be present in small numbers, but influence multiple other players in an ecosystem and thereby uh, induce this, um, a, a healthy microbiome functioning. In the gut, there's different ecosystems. If you geographically, if you go down from the mouth all the way to the end of the colon, um, you can see the different microbes are present, including um, different um, keystone species that are important for each of those ecosystems. Um, and here the, the regional differences in the exposome for these microbes that shape 
um, these, these microbial uh, communities. Diversity, as I mentioned earlier, is also another feature of a healthy ecosystem. Um, if you look at the um, schematic depiction of what happened to the diversity, the microbial diversity um, in individuals living in Western countries um, since um, mid 19th century, a progressive decrease, which is continuing, um, a later onset in developing countries, but at the same t with the same time course, and a delayed onset and smaller onset in the few remnants of um, um, peoples around the world that still live in their hunter-gatherer um, original um, lifestyles. We've also seen that with this change, it has had an impact on diseases, so an increase in uh, autoimmune diseases, metabolic diseases related to obesity, um, um, but it also involves colon cancer, cardiovascular disease, and degenerative brain disorders. And this has all happened uh, with a decrease um, in infectious diseases. So vaccinations and antibiotic treatment has been successful in getting rid of the, the, the bad uh, players, um, but at the cost of an increase in, in diseases and a decrease in diversity. Another depiction of, um, if you look at the change from um, the remnants of hunter-gatherers living on the Orinoco River in Venezuela, the Yanomami, um, all the way up to um, Western countries, US, Canada, Ireland, you can see a progressive decline in the diversity of the gut microbiome um, with increasing westernization of the lifestyle. Um, and you can see that the relative abundance of certain microbes has changed dramatically during that time as well, with a decrease in certain taxa shown here, uh, an increase in others, um, and a dramatic increase, for example, in the uh, bacteroidetes. This has led to the concept that um, we can divide microbes in two big categories, the vanished taxa, those taxa that have disappeared, or uh, are in very low abundances um, in our modern gut, and those that have increased the biosum taxa, um, as for example, the bacteroidetes. So a, a dramatic change in microbial um, diversity, richness, abundance, um, and in these ecosystems. Now, what are the consequences of this ecosystem deterioration on human diseases? Um, first of all, we have to realize that this decrease in the intactness of ecosystems has happened at all levels of, uh, of life, of animal life, of life on the planet. Um, in this, uh, both here shown on this tree of life from microorganisms uh, all the way to large animals, both in land and sea. Um, the main driver has been human influence. Um, this is for um, forest uh, areas of the planet, savanna areas of the planet, and um, ocean areas. And you can see there have been dramatic shifts from intact ecosystems with high diversity of plants and animals to a greatly reduced diversity, mainly now in form of farm animals. This has happened in all these different biotopes. Um, um, and we have now a much larger number of these domestic animals that have replaced intact ecosystems than, um, than we have you know, wild animals uh, living in these different areas. So the changes in the gut mi microbiome ecosystem has been paralleled by an almost simultaneous change in the macrobiological uh, ecosystems. So why has this happened in our gut? Um, so lifestyle, um, change in diet, chronic stress, early colonization, um, exposure of infants in, in hospitals, uh, medical practices, all have led to this change decrease in diversity uh, and relative abundances of certain these vanished species. Um, this altered gut microbiome interacts with a um, stable human, um, determined by the human genome, um, gut connectome with its, um, uh, with its immune system. And this is perceived, this changed microbiome is perceived by the gut connectome um, as a threat, as a warning signal, 
the immune system rings the alarm bells, sends inflammatory molecules throughout the, um, the body to systemic immune activation and affects all our organs, the cause of most of our chronic uh, non-communicable disease epidemic. What efforts are possible for restoring a chronically compromised gut microbial ecosystem? So the current approaches are um, relatively easy, healthy lifestyles, dietary habits, sleep, regular moderate exercise, mind-targeted therapies, um, and possibly supplementary pre- and probiotics. Um, illustration of the diet, going from the standard American diet associated with obesity and all the chronic health problems to one mainly composed of fruits and vegetables is definitely one way um, to counteract this, uh, this current development. It's important to realize it's not just important what we eat, but when we eat, um, and also to know where does the food come from and what impact this has on the environment. Future strategies um, are still, a lot of companies are working on this, a lot of science being done. Personalization of interventions based on comprehensive functional microbiome assessment, novel customized pre and probiotics aimed at keystone species reconstitution, and possibly early life microbial transplantation, which would be pre preventive um, for the rest of this individual's life. So the take home points, the gut microbiome is a community of interrelated ecosystems ranging from the oral cavity to the rectum. The health of these ecosystems is chronically compromised in developed countries and is acutely compromised by antibiotics. Chronic progressive alterations can be restored partially by healthy lifestyles, including diet, sleep, regular exercise, and mind-targeted therapies. And the acute alterations, which we didn't really talk about, primarily induced by the intake of antibiotics, can be treated with a combination of a personalized diet, high in fermented and plant-based foods, and by certain pre- and probiotics. Thank you for your attention. You can read more about the concepts that I laid out in my brief presentation in my two books, uh, particularly the, um, the Gut Immune Connection, which has been published uh, a few months ago. Thank you very much for your attention.